In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Now, it was Ben Franklin, one of our founding fathers, who first said that famous phrase. And now that Ben is dead, well, we have his head on our hundreds. And maybe you haven't seen one lately. I know I don't see him that often. But it's there to remind us whenever we do see it that the only thing certain in this life is death and its taxes. Now, here's the great news that we find here in Numbers chapter 18 and 19. God gives us a way to beat them both. Now, you may be saying right away, what? Well, this is it. See, if we obey God's word, we'll not only defeat death, but we might even get a tax deduction or two along the way. See, and tonight we're going to talk about death and taxes, or more specifically, death and tithing. Now, some right away would say, death and tithing? Oh, no, what is this? Operation crowd reduction? You know, we're going to see if we can slow the rapid growth of this church down to a crawl. Well, admittedly, it wouldn't be maybe top of the list of topics that a church, church growth expert would say, here's what you do to really draw the crowds. Talk about death. Talk about tithing. You know, many people say death. Who wants to talk about that? I'm in a state of denial on that. I'm trying to pretend that it's not out there. And tithing, oh my goodness. Well, you know, if the pastor says that, well, it's going to put pressure on me. And I even invited a friend and I told him, hey, they never talk about money at this church. It's so different here and all that kind of stuff. And people go, oh no. But here's the thing. Tonight's teaching is really not on death and dollars, although some might subtitle it that. I really titled it Living, Giving, God. Because God is primarily about living, not about dying. And God is also more about giving than about taking. But when it comes to death and dollars, I think these are two topics that God gets a really bad rap on. You see, many see God as kind of an angry guy up in the clouds just waiting and wanting to zap us. And as one grateful dead man said, if the thunder don't get you, the lightning will. But others think of God as kind of a cosmic con man, you know, trying to think of new uh, methods and ways to swindle you out of your cash. And when you think about those things, you take them together, what most people or many people think in our society, in our world, is that God is a taker. That God is a taker. That he wants to take your life and take your wallet, take your money. And nothing could be further from the truth on those two things. And though God does sometimes take some things in some ways, at some times. God is really not a taker. God is a giver. He's the giver of life and he is the giver of all good things, as the Bible says. And so let me give you a little preview on those two topics tonight. God doesn't want to take your life. He doesn't want you to die. And he doesn't want to take your money. He doesn't need your dollars. And so tonight, as you think about it, this section of scripture does deal with those two sensitive subjects, dollars and death. But it's really, again, about living and giving and about God the living, giving God. And so we'll take those topics in the order that the chapters present them. We'll look at death, and then we'll turn over to the little, maybe happier topic of tithing, and then we'll go back to death again as we go toward the end. So that's a preview of tonight. And let's actually start at chapter 17, the last two verses. You see chapter 17 of Numbers, verses 12 and 13. The last two there say some interesting things. It says the Children of Israel, verse 12, spoke to Moses saying, Surely we die. We perish. We all perish. And then verse 13, it says, Whoever even comes near the tabernacle of the Lord must die. Shall we utterly die? Now again, many people come to church to get uplifted, and you might say, This is just not doing it for me tonight yet, Scott. But see, it's obvious that at this point, the people were panicked, right? I mean, they're frantic. They're fearful. And and they're kind of saying, hey, run for your life. Get away from God. He's out to wipe us out. And there would be reason for them to think some of those things and to come to some of those conclusions. After all, they had witnessed some dramatic deaths in the recent times. You see Korah's rebellion. We studied that last week. And he was a Levite, a man who was supposed to be a man of God, but he pull, pulled kind of a power play there. And he tried to promote himself to high priest. And so he was saying, hey, I'm God's man. Vote for me. Not, not Moses, not Aaron. And he got grounded. You know, that's what my parents used to do when I was in trouble. But he got literally grounded. The ground opened up and swallowed Korah and his whole clan. And 250 of his followers also were there consumed by fire. And if you look back at the chapter, you'll see 14,000, that's a lot, died in a plague. Now, you can kind of picture the people at this point, if you were one of them, kind of scraping Korah for president bumper stickers off their tent, right? I mean, they're like at this point going, <laughs> Korah who? You know, chanting, Moses, Moses, he's our man, and if Aaron can't do it, nobody can. 
And so they're, you know, changing affiliations somewhat back at this point and coming to Moses and saying, hey, we're going to die. We're going to utterly die. Do something. And you can kind of see at that point that they had a fear, but not the kind of fear of God that we're supposed to have, the kind that leads us to real repentance and really living a righteous life. No, they had a different kind of fear. They wanted to get away from God. They said, hey, at this point, we don't want anything to do with him. He'll take our life just like he did Korah's life. And so, in a way, again, they had a legitimate fear, a fear of death. And the Bible says that that is something that is common to all people. That Whether we admit it or not, whether we deny it or not, much of what we do in life is kind of in anticipation of this thing that we don't want to talk about, but we know is going to happen somehow to all of us, even though we think maybe mighty, maybe Moby, it won't, you know. But then you see people, as they're afraid of perishing, well, these people had seen terrible tragedies, as many of us have. Maybe some of you have been through some things that you would say are no laughing matter. You know, they're things that are very serious things. And so we've been told here, even in chapter 16, that there would be a lot of death going on in the book of Numbers, and we hopefully have kind of prepared ourselves mentally for that. Think about it here as God said, hey, you're all going to die before the promised land. What was he saying? Well, there were about 1.2 million people uh, or so that fit the category of those who he said would die, and that's over a 40-year span, and even if you just use some kind of round numbers, we're talking there about 30,000 people a year. Now, sometimes, in, as we'll see in the narrative, it was in big bunches, but you know, that's an average of 80 funerals per day. And so this was quite a uh, deadly time in Israel's history. And here's the issue that was for the Israelites, if you really think about it. They saw God as the problem, not as the solution. They saw God as a taker rather than a giver. And so they were thinking in their minds, hey, if I can just stay away from God, if I can kind of keep a low profile, uh, maybe God won't get me like he's getting everybody else. And so I like to tell people, and we need to know that God is all about life. You know, when you really think about it, the Bible never talks about him as the dying God. He's always the living God. He's always the giver of life. And so you see him being the life, as Jesus said, the living God. And yet here we see the people connecting God more with death than with life. How did this happen? How did the tabernacle, which was meant to be the place of God's glory, how was it supposed to be that God's presence, which would be the very thing that would give them victory, suddenly it became the temple of doom to them? And they were like, I don't want to go anywhere near I don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, to answer that question, I think we have to go back a little bit to the beginning of the Bible and ask a more basic question, which is, if God is all about life, why do we see so much death? Why do we experience it? Why do we see it all around us? And after a death, of course, there are a lot of questions that come into anyone's mind, especially if the circumstances of that death are sort of unusual or spectacular, suspicious. And I think all of us, if we have been paying any attention, know of at least one high-profile death that happened in South Florida, and that's Anna Nicole Smith. Now, thinking about that, you know, of course, right after she died, all the questions came out, you know, investigated journalists, everybody came out of the woodwork, CSI, all the rest of that, real life, CSI Miami and the autopsies and all these types of things. And they're all trying to answer questions, right? Who, what, when, where, why, how did this happen? And of course, as we talk about death, we also talk about dollars and everyone wants to know who gets the money, right? Who gets the baby, who gets the body, who gets the money that she left behind? And so you see in that, not every death, of course, makes the front page like that. But on a private level, probably all of us could point to some times in our life where death has hit our house whether it be a parent, whether it be a child, a friend, or a brother, or a sister, or any of those other things, well, you know, death does eventually hit home, doesn't it? And the biggest question will probably not be, hopefully not be, who gets the money or who gets the dollars. It might be more along the lines of why. Why death? Why this death? Why now? Why us? Why did this happen? How could God take this person from me? And so sometimes people do talk about natural causes, you know, death from natural causes. And one of the things I really want to lodge into our brains here as we look at the Bible is that actually there's no such thing as natural causes when it comes to death. And whether it's a disaster or a disease, whether it's a bullet or it is a old age death, well, death is never natural. Now, some of you would say, sure it is, Scott. You all only have to do is turn on the uh, Discovery Channel and in between... Uh, shows about how Jesus never existed and stuff like that, they also have some that'll show you that death is natural, you know, that Mother Nature does these things and all things die, you know, you have plants that die and you have animals that die and people die and my car battery dies and that's just the way it is and some things will never change and all that death is certain. 
but again, I come back to the question, why? Why is it that way? I, I won't just accept that it's that way. It's not that way. It hasn't always been that way. Why death at all? And so if you've ever seen a death certificate, think about this. Sometimes they put primary cause of death and secondary causes underneath. And I'm here to say that, you know what, the primary cause of death on every single death certificate in the world should say the fall, the fall. That's the cause, a fatal fall. Whatever the secondary cause of death was, the primary cause is the fall. Genesis 3, that is the fall of man into sin. And God's plan for man is life. You see that? It has been, it always will be. God's plan for man is life. And God is the living God and he brings life and he gave his life to us. It says he breathed the breath of life into man, different than every other animal. And so though all things die, well, there's something different about us. And you see the living, giving God, and, and yet you see death. Where did death come from? What is it all about? Why are we all under this death penalty? Well, again, it comes back to what the Bible says there's sin in that same section. Sin came in, and it brought death. Before that, everything God had done was good. But then you see sin came in. And God gave life, but sin took it. Sin took life away. And God had said it so Clearly, so simply, Genesis 12, uh, 2, 17, if you sin, you will die. If you sin, you will die. And so what you see is the reason being that God is life, and sin separates us from that life. Sin separates us from the life of God. Sin always separates. And so the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. And so you see no sin. Well, there was no death. There was no suffering. It was the Garden of Eden, right? It was a great thing. And so then you see sin comes in and it ruins everything. And as Romans 8, and we studied that one a while back, verse by verse, but one of the sections of it talks about the fact that, you know what? It's not just sinners who suffer because of sin. All creation suffers because of sin. And so if you've ever even buried a pet and you've said, oh, this is so sad, what, did, what is up with this? Well, you know what? What that is, is that all creation, it says, is groaning under the weight of sin. And death is not natural. It's not God's plan for man. God's plan for man is life. And you see, we talk so much even now about global warming and things like that. You know, it's a real concern. But you see, Al Gore, I believe, made a, a quote even that came out today that said, the earth has a fever, you know, and, and that was his diagnosis. And, and nothing against Al's statement, but here's the thing. I hate to tell you, but it's more than a fever. The, the Bible says, you know what, it's, it's sin-soaked world is dead unto death. I mean, it is dying unto death. It's a dying world. It's not just a little, woo, we'll get over it kind of fever. No, it's something much more serious than that. And so death is really just the final demonstration of the fact that the depth of our fall, the weight of it all, well, we've fallen and we can't get up. And so don't blame God for death. You know, sometimes people shake their fist at God. How could you? And if you're going to do that, shake your fist at sin. That's the real issue there. God isn't the problem. He's actually the solution when it comes to death. And so sin's the problem. Death is the result. And you know what? God gives the remedy. In fact, God is the remedy. He's the living, giving God. And he is the remedy for the problem of sin and death. And so you see in verse 1 of chapter 18, it says, Then the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's house, house with you shall bear the iniquity related to the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear the iniquity associated with your priesthood. And also being with you, verse 2 in chapter 18, it's also bring with you your brethren of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may be joined with you and serve with you while you and your sons with you are before the tabernacle of witness. So God is again underlining here the purpose of the priesthood as we go through it. And you see in verse 3, it says, And they, the Levites and the priests, shall attend to your needs and all the needs of the tabernacle, but they shall not come near the articles of the sanctuary and the altar. That's where the holy, holy things of God were. It says, Lest they die, they and you also. And then it says in verse 4 and 5, They shall be joined with you. He's talking about the whole tribe of the Levites. And he says, And attend to the needs of the tabernacle of meeting for all the work of the tabernacle. But an outsider, that's one who doesn't have a right to get in there, he says, shouldn't come near to you. And you shall attend the duties of the sanctuary and the duties of the altar, and there will be no more wrath on the children of Israel. Now, as we go through the Old Testament, it, it requires us to put on 
our spiritual thinking caps sometime because God is here painting pictures that we need to connect the dots into the New Testament and understand these things as they apply to our life. And that's what we're doing here tonight. And the first part of Numbers chapter 18 here, it talks about the purpose of the priesthood. And what you see there in verse 1, it talked about bearing the iniquity of the people and of the place and all of this stuff. It says bearing the iniquity. That's another word for sin. It just says bearing the sin. And then you see in verse 5 it says removing the wrath. Those are two important ones because it connects wrath and sin. And we'll see that has a lot to do with tonight. And then you see Aaron and his sons, when they were doing their job, God had put them in their place and he says, when you guys are doing your job and you're doing it well, guess what? It's a God-given role. It's a God-given responsibility. And the result of it is no iniquity, no wrath, no judgment, no plague, no problem. And so you see people... The problem was that they wanted always to go around the priesthood, say, we don't really need that. I know God's provided this, but we don't want it. We want to go right in there because, hey, we're good enough for God, aren't we? And so they would try to make always this direct contact with God or elevate themselves above their place that God had put them in. And what would happen? Wrath, instant death. And we see that throughout the chapters here. Now let's talk for a minute as long as we're talking about a word like death, which is not a necessarily happy word. How about wrath? There's another one for church growth. Hey, wrath, come here a study on the wrath of God. Woo! You know, invite your friends. But look, verse 5, it talks about wrath. And a lot of folks don't want to acknowledge the reality of wrath. Let's just redefine God in our own terms, a nice, happy thing, and we never have to talk about these things, and we'll make a God of our own image. But you know what? If a person says, look, I don't believe in a God of wrath, you know what they're really saying? I don't believe in a God of righteousness. I don't believe in a God of holiness. I don't believe in a God of perfection and purity. I don't believe in a God of light and life, as the Bible says that he is. See, God's wrath is kind of the flip side of all of those wonderful truths. It's an inevitable byproduct of the fact that God is holy, that he is perfect. And so God must judge in order to be just. There's no way for a person to be just and not have a judgment when it comes to sin. And so God's wrath, we need to know, it's not like the wrath of man. It's totally different. I mean, the Bible even says the anger of God has nothing to do with the anger of man. They're not the same thing. God's wrath is not him like blowing his stack and losing it. You know, finally, that's it. I can't take it anymore. And boom, wrath. No, it's just a byproduct of the fact that he is perfect. He has purity. And when he comes into contact with sin, well, sin is going to be removed. You see the example of that kind of in our lives. You see, we talk about him being the living God. And, of course, the word there is live or life or li live, you know. And, and we talk also in that same way about that same word, a live wire. Uh, you know, after the hurricane or something, if there's a, a uh, wire down, they say, oh, don't go out there. It's a live wire. You touch a live wire, wire you would think, oh, good, you'll live right? It's a live wire. No, you'll die. Well, why do I die? It's a live wire. Because, you know what? It's a live wire, but it's alive with something that if you touch it, you will die. And see, this is the thing. The reason is I'm not built to be in contact with that kind of power and that kind of purity in that thing. I don't have the insulation that it requires for me to do that without dying. And so in the Bible, of course, they hadn't uh, invented electricity in those times. And so there's a talk also uh, of God being a consuming fire. And all of these are things to help us understand the invisible, indescribable God. But the language, of course, there it is. God is a consuming fire. And sometimes you'll read a report and it'll say, oh, the wrath of this fire. But think about it. If a fire consumes a bunch of paper or something, you know, it, we don't really believe that there's something personal, like that fire was like, ah, that, I'm going to pick that and I'm going to get it. No, you know what? It's just what happens when fire comes in contact with combustible material. And in a similar way, that's how the Bible really describes the wrath of God. You know what it is? It's God's holiness coming into contact with sin. And the result of that, well, it's called wrath. And the result of that is death. And so what we see again from that old song, hey, ashes, ashes, we all fell down. That's what happened when sin came in. So why did they die in numbers? Well, the same thing. You know, we see them dying in droves in the book of Numbers, you know, over and over again. A million point two in 40 years. What an amazing thing. And at the same time, we see, hey, you know what? The numbers haven't improved. <laughs> it's still 10 out of every 10 people die, even today, with all of our medical advances. And so some died as a very immediate, direct 
result of their sin, and you see that with Korah. But that doesn't mean everyone who dies at an untimely time or something like that, that, like they call it, as if there was a timely time to die. But you say, oh, he died at an untimely time, you know, an untimely death. Well, some others died as an indirect result of the fact that all of creation has fallen and is under a death penalty. And so, again, we talk about death, we talk about taxes tonight, and the thing is, you know what? You have a better chance of outrunning the IRS and hiding from them than you do hiding from the undertaker. You have an appointment with him, an audit, if you will, with the undertaker. And so even a casual reader of the Bible can look at these things and say, you know what? There's a lot of death in the Bible. Yeah, there is. But you know what? The last thing on earth God wants in anybody's life is wrath. That is not his desire for anybody. His desire is mercy. His desire is grace. His desire is forgiveness. But his holiness is who he is. And the wrath is part of that, the wrath for sin. And so the result of holiness coming in contact with sin is wrath and death, just as sure as fire burns paper. And so God isn't the problem. It's something that we need to know. God isn't the problem, but he is the solution. And so God didn't want to take life, but he wants to give life. How does he do that? Well, he gives a gift, and that's the priesthood, as you see in verse 6. Stick with the thought here. You see him saying in verse 6, Behold, I myself have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. They are a gift to you, given by the Lord, to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Therefore, you and your sons with you shall attend to the priesthood for everything at the altar and behind the veil. That's in the holy place. And he says, And you'll serve. And I'll give your priesthood to you as a gift for service, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Again, we're talking tonight about death, but I, I remind you, it's the living, giving God that we really want to talk about and focus in on. And even in a chapter that talks about death here, it many times, as a matter of fact, if you count them up, 17 times in this one chapter, it uses some variant of the word gift or giving. As he's talking about the problem of sin, he still says, hey, I, I am the solution, and here's what I'm doing. I'm giving a gift 17 times in this one chapter. And there is a way to beat death. What is it? Deal with sin. Deal with sin, you deal with the wrath of God, you deal with death. And so that's the purpose of the priest, as you see it in the Old Testament. And look at verse 6. It says it and emphasizes it at the beginning. It says, I myself. In other words, God's saying, this was my idea. This is my way of dealing with sin. I want to do that because I don't want to have wrath. I want to have forgiveness. I want to have grace. And so the purpose of the priesthood, again, in the Old Testament, it was pointing forward to Jesus. And we'll see that as we unfold the chapter. But it's a gift of the Lord. And so it was for the purpose that they wouldn't perish. So they wouldn't be plagued. So they wouldn't be under the wrath of God. And if we need to know it as clearly as the Bible says it, you can write it down, Ezekiel, or just Zeke, as uh, we know him so personally, Ezekiel, Zeke, it's 18.32. Chapter 18, verse 32. This is God speaking. He says, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone. Therefore, turn and live. Again, over and over again, God is saying the same thing. I'm not about dying. I'm about living. But you are under the death penalty as the way things are right now if you don't know the Lord. And so the Bible talks about death in two ways, and it's so important for us to know these things. It's so important for us to understand these things. As you see it, there's two different ways it's talked about. The physical death, that's one way that the Bible uses the term, but also spiritual death. And they are used with this kind of terminology. The Bible says the first death when it's talking about this. The first death is physical. You can just write that down or keep it in your mind. First death physical. Separation, again, separation. That's what death is all about. That's why we don't like it, because it's a separation from the people that we care about, right? And so you see in that, that separation, it's the separation of the soul from the body. Can't do anything about that one. That one's already been decided. All of us will die physically unless the Lord returns first. And that's a glorious hope, but it's not been the case for, for centuries and centuries of Christians. So we hope for it, we trust in it, but God may allow us to go through the process of death physically just like others. But see, here's the thing. Death is not the end of the line. Death is a door. It's just simply a doorway. That's what we see in the Bible. It's a doorway. Death is a doorway. And death opens the door to either heaven or hell. Now think about the game shows. You know, door number one or door number two. And you go, door number one, eternal heaven and bliss. No death, no suffering, no pain, no taxes. And then you say, door number two eternal pain and suffering, 
Separation from God forever. Which one would you like? Well, I don't know. Give me some time. Ding, dong, ding, dong. Hmm, door number one, door I guess I'll take eternal bliss. Yeah, I'll take heaven, doorway to heaven. Hey, good choice. Excellent choice. See, Revelation 21 says there's something beyond that door that's the second death. That's what it talks about, the second death, worse than anything that could be here on this earth, the physical thing, spiritual. Separation of the soul from God for all eternity. And so that's the gift that God gives is not only life, a different life that you can live here on this side of the door, but on the other side of the door, that's the real issue in our lives. And this whole thing, this priesthood, was a foreshadowing of a person, a person named Jesus. And that Jesus, as we study even in the book of John, we'll get to this, I think, in about 16 weeks as we're going through it. It'll be John chapter 3. And uh, it says, you must be born again. You must be born again. And we'll treat it, of course, uh, in more depth at that point. But it's one of the most famous sections of Scripture in the whole world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. See, he's a giver, not a taker, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Now, that doesn't mean you come to Christ and you never physically die. I mean, we've been to funerals of Christians, but it's a much different thing because of what lies behind the door. See, it's been said in such a succinct way, it's really nice to remember, and you can maybe share it with some of your friends this way. You know what? Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Okay, I'll say it again. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. What do I mean by that? Well, born once. If you're born just physically, but never born of the Spirit, you know what that means? You die twice, physically and spiritually, eternal separation from God. Born by faith in Christ, that's born a second time. Not only born physically, but born again spiritually, as Jesus described it there. That's born twice, and that means you die once. Die physically, yeah, but that's the doorway to heaven. Not spiritually, never to die spiritually. And so you see the living, giving God. That's what he's doing. God is a giver, not a taker. He's wanting to give us life. And so sin took life, but God gives it back. And I like this. We'll talk about it more in chapter 19 at the end. But if you've never made that decision, you need to make that decision today, and we'll give an opportunity to do that. But let's turn to the other topic in this section. You know, we talked about death, and that was a lot of fun. But now we're going to talk about tithing. Now, some of you say, I'd rather die than tithe. Or if I tie, I'll di tithe, I'll die, you know, or something like that. But look what it says here. I, I, again, I hope to change some people's perspective on God because he's a living, giving God. And you see in verse 8, it says, The Lord spoke to Aaron here. I myself have also given you charge of my heave offerings. You know, I don't know what that is. You kind of picture, heave, you know, here you go. And the holy gifts of the children of Israel, I have given them as a portion to you and to your sons as an ordinance forever. And then skipping down to verse 12, we'll just kind of hit some of the highlights in here. It says, all the best of the oil, all the best of the new wine and the grain, the first fruits which they offer to the Lord, I've given them to you. And one purpose that you see here in the Old Testament of the tithes was to provide for the priests and the Levites. And what you see is a principle that pervades the Bible. Some of these Things have been modified in some ways for the New Testament understanding, but this does not change. The first and the best always belong to the Lord. That's what you see. And the God that we serve, he has need of nothing. This is so important for us to see. So many times God is misrepresented as this guy in raggedy clothes kind of with his hands out at the corner saying, please, you know, give. I'm just about to go chapter 11. But you see, God's not a giver. I mean, God's a giver, not a taker. He is a giver get confused but you see that whatever God said here whatever's given to me guess what I'll give it to you Levites now you think about this what it, one of the things he was giving them was barbecue now here tonight is Rudy and if you haven't had Rudy's ribs his barbecue how many of you have had Rudy's ribs at some point or another yeah you know what I'm talking about but think about this this is what God's saying hey you priests, you know, in the service of me, we're going to just throw a barbecue every now and then. And then they give their little sacrifice. And guess what? Woo, we all get ribs, you know, maybe even as good as Rudy's ribs. But that's what you see in here. And, and unless you think, hey, man, I want to be a Levite. These guys got it made. Well, remember in here, there was a price that went with their privilege. Remember what it said? You're going to bear the iniquity of that stuff. You're going to have some hazardous duty. You know, you kind of mess around with the uh, things of God and you will uh, find yourself not doing so well, as Cora could attest to. And so there's no inheritance for them. That's what you see in there. It's interesting. It's like God says, hey, I'll provide you with plenty, but at the other end of it, you know, there's really no inheritance here for you. Not storing up treasures here. And again, we're supposed to, as we go through here, relate most to the Levites, right? That's who we're supposed to relate to. This was the tribe picked to be the 
tribe that would serve God as we do. And the Bible even talks about the fact that we are a kingdom of priests as we follow the Lord. The thing that goes on there. Now you see verse 20, it says, The Lord said to Aaron, the high priest, he said, You'll have no inheritance in their land. You shall not have any portion among them. I'm your portion. That's what he says. I'm your inheritance among the children of Israel. So it's great. God's kind of saying to him, Hey, I'll take care of you. But you know what? At the end of the day, Aaron, I want to make sure you don't get so excited about the stuff that I'm doing for you that you put more emphasis on that than you do on me. You know, at the end of the day, you're not really going to have your tent stake stuck pretty uh, deep there in the, in the land of promise. The real promise for you, well, the inheritance is me, and the inheritance comes after. And so it's a good lesson for us to learn. And you see also in verse 26 some more principles that we can pull out of this. It says, Speak thus to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the children of Israel the tithes which I've given you from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. So what are they saying? Hey, heave a tenth of the tithe that you get, the, the money that God gives you, you give a tenth of that too. This is really interesting as you see it. What was it? Nobody was exempted from it. Those who even made their living by the fact that they were supported by other tithes, they themselves tithe, and we're expected to do that. Now, what does that mean? Well, again, the Bible talks about the fact that we're not to blow trumpets about things and all the rest, but you know what? And the role that I'm in right now, I'm a teacher. I have to teach these things, and I have to say some things about this. So this is what I'm going to say about it. You know what? We practice what we preach here. We are tithers here on the staff, and you know what else? We not only tithe as individuals, we tithe as a church. And it's one of the things I look at, and we don't mention money that often. But hey, the Bible's mentioning it tonight. We're going to talk about it tonight because we teach the Bible. But here's the thing. A tithe, what it means literally is ten. It means a tenth. It means a penny for every dime. It means a dime for every dollar. It means a dollar for every ten. It means a ten for every Ben. That's Ben Franklin, you know, on the hundreds. Now, as I think about that with you, a ten for every bin. I hold in my hand here ten tens, a hundred, all right? Now, whose money is this, okay? Whose money is this? Where did it come from? Some of you are saying, it's mine. I left it under the seat, and you can give it here. No, it's mine. I made it. And I literally mean that. I made it. I, I photocopied it. It's not real. <laughs> I, I made it right here on the photocopy. And as a matter of fact, this is how we're planning on paying for some of the new projects around here. You know, we just... <laughs> We got this nice color copier. No, I intentionally left the back blank so that nobody would see it laying around and try and pay for Rudy's ribs over at the cafe <laughs> with these. Or pay for the heat tickets that, that Pedro, which are also blank on the back. These are also just an example. Okay, this is just an example. But we are not counterfeiters here at the church. But here's the thing. This is the thing that I'm trying to make a point of. This is my money, right? Let's say this is my money. And you come along and you say, hey, I want $10 of your money. And you say, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That's my money. All 10 is mine. You can't have it. You can't have it. It's mine. I made it. Go get your own. Now, let's turn the tables for a minute. Let's say I have here 10 real dollars, you know, 10 real 10s. And I give you the whole 100. I hand it over to you. And I say, hey, would, would you just give me 10 back? Just to show, just to say, just so you know, just so you remember, just so you acknowledge that the 90 came from me to begin with. The whole 100 came from me. What would you say at that point? <laughs> cool. Good deal. Now, you think about that. What is it that I'm trying to illustrate? Something very simple. Our perspective all depends on whose money we think it is. If we think it's our money, well, then we say, well, God, I don't know if I want to give you my money. I don't know how much of my money I want to give you. But if we have the perspective that everything we have and everything that we are is God's, we're going to think so much differently about it. See, if the whole hundred is mine, then I say, I don't know if I want to give. If the whole hundred is his, I say, hey, God, you give me 90, I, I give away 10. Hey, we're doing great. This is a deal I can do my whole life. And you think about that, verse 30. Look what it says. I think it's so refreshing. It says this, therefore, you shall say to them, when you have lifted up the best of it, he was talking about the first of it, he says, then the rest shall be accounted to the Levites as the produce of the threshing floor and the produce of the wine press. And you may eat it any place in your households. It's your reward for the work in the tabernacle of meeting. And he says, verse 32, you shall bear no sin because of it, because you lifted up the best of it. But you shall not profane the holy gifts of the children of Israel, lest you die. So what's he saying here? This is great. Verse 30, what's he say? If you honor God with the first and best, guess what? God will generously give you the rest. And he says, guess what? You don't bear any sin with that. There's nothing wrong with that. God loves to give. He's very generous. There's no problem with that. 
And so the whole hundred is his, and so he expects us to use wisdom in the treatment of the whole hundred, but he says at the same time, listen, give me the first and best to remember that it was all mine to begin with, and the rest, well, hey, you know, there's no sin with that. There's no problem with that. And many at this point, again, they, they start to backpedal, and they say, well, wait a minute, though, you know, this is the Old Testament, right? I mean, aren't we in the New Testament? Isn't that part of the law and all this, and we're not under law and all that kind of thing? I, I hear that all the time with people with tithing. And you know what I say? You're absolutely right. We're not under the law. But here's the thing. We're under love. We're under a new law. And you know what? Love never does less than the law. I've never found a situation in which love does less than the law. When Jesus was talking about the law, he says, I said, don't murder. But when he's talking about love, he says, don't hate. See, that's a, that's a higher standard, not a lower one. And so when you look at those things, you go, oh, we're not under law. Okay, we're over law. We're in a, a covenant of grace. We're in a covenant that is based on love. And, you know, love has no preset spending limit. That's the one thing I've learned. You know, if you watch two people who are in love, it's funny. They will spend like crazy. I mean, on each other. Whoa, we're in love. Money is no object. We, you know, let it fly. Why? Because we're in love. But then uh, they're not in love. Hey, it's mine. You know, my, 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 my. And it's funny how people do that. Love has a way of changing things, doesn't it? And so this principle is so pervasive throughout the whole Bible, it's impossible to miss it unless you really want to, which is that the first and best are God's. And you know what? With the first and best, he says, okay, enjoy the rest. Invest it eternally. Invest it in the things that matter most and enjoy it. That's okay. And so you see, sometimes the enjoyment, the more you're, enjoying the living giving God I think one of the most enjoyable things is giving you start to really enjoy the process and so far too many Christians unfortunately kind of instead of first and best they're like last and worst God will get that okay I'll give him last and worst you know the lint at the bottom of my pocket these are the leftovers Woo! let's see what we got this week whoa fuzz you know okay well I'll stick that in the box but here's the thing it, again the Bible uses the word First fruits, not last fruits. You know what last fruits are? Last fruits are the stuff at the bottom of your fridge. I was just getting one out today. I went in there to look for a banana, and there in the fruit drawer was a black banana. Now, you know, you look at that and you go, okay, I'll make a smoothie out of it. But, it, but it's not like the first fruits, you know, those beautiful yellow bananas that actually are good, you know. But what you see there is so many people, that's what they do, the leftovers. But there's never leftover. Have you ever noticed that? If you give God your leftovers, you'll find out there's nothing left over. And so what you see is people saying, I can't afford to tithe. And someday when I make more money, I'll tithe. But that's, that's just the wrong concept. It doesn't even go with the Bible. See, I would say to someone who says, I can't, afford not, I can't afford to tithe, I'd say, I can't afford not to. I can't afford not to. Remember, God's a giver, not a taker. You can't outgive God. Now, some would say, oh, you're just trying to raise funds for the church. You know what? If that's the way you feel, here's what I would say to you. Give it to God some other way and see if it's not still true. I'm not just trying to get people to give here. Hey, this is the bottom line. This principle applies as we give to God, as we reflect his giving nature. And I don't know anyone in all my years of, of talking on this topic, and I do get to talk on it. You know, anyone who talks with these things and walks in these, I don't know anyone who's followed God's financial plans and came out a loser out the other end and said, you know, I, that was the worst investment I ever made was following God's word. See, here's the truth. I can do better with 90% and God than I can do with 100% and just me. That's the bottom line. The God factor. We've talked about that so many times in these things. And Malachi 3.8, a very famous verse that people look at, and we look at it and think about it here tonight. Malachi 3.8. You know what it says? It says, don't rob God. That would be a bad thing. If you're going to rob somebody, please don't rob God. Sometimes people steal. You know, we've had some things stolen from the church and things like, oh, yikes. You know, I wouldn't steal from God. It's his stuff. You know, I, if you're going to go steal, go steal from the heathens, you know. And so at least don't steal from God. I mean, that, he, he'll find you out. That's for sure. But you see, it says there, why would you rob God? And they say, well, we're not stealing from God. And he says, yes, you are. You're not giving to God. You're not giving first and best. But this is what's so interesting as you keep reading. You know what it says? You're actually robbing yourself. Because, again, God has need of nothing. It's not like he says, oh, we're going to have to dim the lights in heaven. You know, we can't pay the electric bill this month. <laughs> Streets of gold, start chipping them away, you know, where they haven't been given. Uh, God doesn't need anything. But he says, you robbed me. Who's the loser? You're the loser. And he says, try me on this. 
It's one of the few times in the Bible God says, test me, try me, I'll prove it to you. I will prove it to you that if you give, not to get, if you give to get, hey, it doesn't work. Here's the thing, if you give because of love for God and for an obedience to his word, guess what? He says, over the long run, I guarantee you, you won't lose physically, you won't lose spiritually, you'll be happy you did it. And so as I look at it, you know, basic biblical management, financial management, this is where it starts. It's all God's, 100%. And as soon as I recognize that, all the rest makes sense and falls into place. And so death and taxes, yeah, they're certain. But obedience to God, as I said before, can get us out of both. It can save us on death, save us from death, but it can also save on your taxes. And the fact that we live in a country that actually gives a tax break for people who give to God, well, that in itself is a gift from God because not every place is like that. Now, think about it. Money given to God is tax exempt. You know what that means? Tax deduction there. You know what it means? I can store up treasures in heaven tax-free. That's what it means. <laughs> tax-free. Treasures in heaven. That's awesome. Now, some, again, are somewhere in their mind, they're thinking, man, that sounds so carnal. That sounds so physical. It sounds so practical. Is this a tax seminar or is this a Bible study? Well, it's both. It's both of those. You see, the Bible is very direct on the subject of money. It doesn't mince words about it. It's not ashamed of it, and we shouldn't be either. You know, the Bible comes right out on these things. It's very practical. It talks about death. It talks about dollars, and it says, hey, you can't keep money. Death is the end. Death, all bets are off, you know. You can't take it past that door. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. That's what God basically says. Jesus said it this way. Don't store up for yourself treasures on this earth. Moths eat here. They, he gives even a practical reason. Look, it, it's a bad investment. He says, rust destroys, thieves steal. And all he's basically saying is this is a fallen world. Remember that? He said, all creation's groaning, man. And your car, which started off so great, is going to be groaning before you know it. Everything on earth is a terrible investment. No matter how well it does. No matter what its chart looks like. In the end, death, eh, that's the end of the investment unless we send it on ahead. And so that's what you see. I, this year, had the joy of getting a new car, the first new car of my life. It's a Jeep. And it had that beautiful new car smell. You know what I'm talking about. It just lasts for a little while. But here's the thing. I only have 4,000 miles on it right now. This is the first time I ever did this, you know. But I, I'm enjoying it. Get in, smell that new car smell. But here's the thing. I got in the other day. It's not what I smelled. I smelled kids <laughs> and crumbs and something that I still haven't found, okay? <laughs> I, it's, it's brand new. Now, here's the thing. A couple of you, I know some folks here who got new cars. I know someone who even got one today. And I'm going to go out into his car afterwards, and I'm going to inhale really deep. And I'm going to hold my breath. I'm going to go get in my car <laughs> and exhale that new car smell. So if you see me doing that, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to bring back that thing to my car. But here's the thing. No matter how great your car looks, you know, you see that slide that we keep putting up here that has the background of the wilderness wanderings and there's that truck, you know. That thing used to have the car, new car smell. <laughs> Who knows what it smells like now, but that's what they all look like now. And sometimes when I see cars going down the road, I think, somebody bought that new. A purple thing like that? Why did they ever buy that new? You know, or whatever. But you see, eternal investments are so different. No risk, no rust. All they do is appreciate. And one of the biggest and best investments I've ever had the privilege of being involved in was a purchase of some slum land in Africa. Now, some of you say, well, that sounds like a bad idea. No, here's the thing. As a pastor, one of the privileges, one of the joys we get is directing the tithes of God's people into the work that God has called us to do. And one of my favorites that I've been able to do, and many, many of these, but... It, it was $20,000, and I mentioned that amount because it, it was kind of like you say, wow, 20, so to some of you, that's a ton. To others, you say, no, nah, that's not much. But it was to help build a building in Kenya for one of the missions that we support here. And you know what? That group there, uh, 20000 I don't know if you've looked at real estate here. It doesn't buy much in Miami, does it? But it buys a lot, actually, in the slums of Africa. And what it bought was a place for pastors to be trained, to teach, to the least of the least of the least of people that are so often forgotten. Now, I think about that. You know what? That was a wonderful check to write. I enjoyed writing that one. I enjoy signing my name, but I, I realize, hey, it's not my money. It's the money of God's people. And many of you, maybe even in this room, played a part in that. And that's part of your eternal investment. And just one of them. But you think about dollars and death, financial problems. What, why do they tie together? Think about it this way. 
It's been the death of many a marriage. I do a lot of marital counsel in addition to financial counsel, and they're very closely tied. A lot of marriages die that way. A lot of families get wrecked that way financially. Work and worry. We work ourselves to death. We worry to death. All this stuff. We're drowning in debt. You know, that's how you die. Death by debt. You know, buried under bills. But what happens also oftentimes is a person's mastered by money rather than Jesus being their master. Well, what ends up happening is they don't even enjoy what they have. All that they have and all that they get, if that's their God, it's not a very enjoyable thing. And so tithing gives us a great freedom. That's why I can talk about it so freely. It, freedom from greed. It, it'll free you from greed as you get in the habit of giving it away. You also will find yourself freed from guilt. You know, sometimes Christians, that's the thing. They, they, they're, so, they're, they're like, oh, isn't it really bad to have anything? Isn't it bad to enjoy anything? I, if I have anything, I really won't enjoy it. That, that'll be real spiritual. No, he says, hey. Enjoy the stuff that I give you. If I give you something, I don't add any trouble to it. And God has given us things to richly enjoy, the Bible says. Many of them physical, but the more things that we enjoy, it's really the spiritual. And so the first and best, and he says, manage the rest. That's the way I'm going to do it with you. And I'll be teaching a class on this April 14th. That's for you who know taxes, the day before tax deadline. Might still be able to file a little extension. But if you'd like to talk more about this, have any questions about some of the specifics, we'll go into it then. And all of these things are an effort for you to be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, when you get to heaven. And so... We've talked about taxes, but I promised we'd go back and talk about death. Some of you are saying, hey, I want to talk more about death. You know, at least change the subject from money. Uh, you know, at least we can talk about death. And that's not as personal somehow. You know, my, so you look at chapter 19, and it's a chapter about death. Chapter 19 in Numbers, it's a chapter about death. And it's specifically about the death of a red heifer. Now, again, some of us go, good, we can talk about that. Just don't talk about my death. Talk about the death of a cow. That's no big deal. But here's the thing. Again, the picture's painted in the Old Testament there for our New Testament understanding. And what you see in chapter 19 is something very unusual, which is an entire chapter devoted to one specific type of sacrifice. It was a very unusual thing in many different ways. First of all, it's unusual for a whole chapter to be all about that. There are many chapters about sacrifices, but usually each type and each thing gets only a little bit of, of paragraphs. But this one gets a whole chapter, and we won't read it verse by verse. But what you will see if you look at it later is some things that I'll help um, highlight here tonight. And you see that this red heifer, it was not only unusual because of this whole chapter devoted to it, but it was in a different place than most of them. Most of them were in Leviticus, if you were here for those studies. And that's where all of these sacrifices were described in detail. But then there's this one out in the middle of Numbers here. And so it should draw our attention to it. And I hope we do pay attention to it tonight. It's an amazing picture of our living, giving God right here in Numbers 19. So we'll hit the highlights, first six verses, read them together with me, and then we'll comment on them. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there's no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. And verse 3 says, You shall give it to Eliezer the priest, that he may take it outside the camp. If you have a highlighter, hit that one, because we'll talk about it. And it says, It shall be slaughtered before him, and Eliezer the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. And then verse 5, it says, The heifer shall be burned in his sight. It's talking about Eliezer there. It says, Burned in the, the man's sight. It's hide, it's flesh, it's blood, it's awful, whatever that is, I'm sure it's awful. And it shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. Now, you look at this, and again, sometimes when we see these things, people tune out and say, I just don't want to even think about these things. But here's the thing, we need to think about them. Some things to point out as we look at it. Every word in God's word matters. You see at the beginning it says, God was speaking to Moses and Aaron. Now, if you look in your Bibles, you'll find out that's kind of unusual. Usually, he talked to Moses. Occasionally, he talked to Aaron. But here he says, hey, Mo and Aaron, I need to talk to both of you, not one or the other. I want you both to hear this and not miss any of it. It's really important. I want you to hear this together, guys. And he says, I want this red heifer to be perfect in every way. And he says, no outside, no inside problems, nothing that, no scars, nothing. He says, and I want... It to have no yoke. There's no joke. No yoke there. He says, I, it needs to be a common animal. No, an uncommon animal. One that is 100% pure red. 
Now, what you see is one that was born for this very reason. Never, you know, pulling a plow or any of the rest of that stuff. Born for this specific purpose. Born to die. And he says he's going to be red. Not even one little white hair. Not one little black spot. Nothing. Red all the way through. And then he says, verse 3, give it to Eliezer, this guy here, and he's going to take it outside the camp. Outside the camp. That wasn't the normal spot for a sacrifice. Not outside the camp. It was inside the camp. It was inside the temple there, the tabernacle. That's where it usually happened. And he says, take some blood, sprinkle that in the holy place. But guess what? Outside the camp there, burn it completely. Everything. Total loss. Down to the ashes. And you see in verse 6, he says, before it's all the way burned, throw some stuff in that fire. Cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet. Now, you think about all those things. You go, all right, what's God getting into here? The purpose of this ritual, the purpose of this chapter here, it was to deal with death, the defilement of death. What it was was the ashes there would be mixed with water. As they're wandering through the wilderness, I remind you there were 30,000 deaths a year. You see a million two dead in this 40-year period. And he says, you know, during this time, there's going to be a lot of defilement. And he says, you're just going to have this ready-made thing to deal with it. And remember, death is the ultimate result of sin. It's the most defiling of things. It's the most devastating of events in our life. Why? Because it is the full fruition of sin. And so you see what he's doing here. He, he takes a perfect sacrifice, flawless, valuable. Oh, this would have been a valuable cow here. And he says the result, ashes, reduced to ashes. The red heifer had one purpose, which was to deal with death, the defilement of it. And for them, that's what it was about. But for us, this is the application. It's a picture of Jesus, as all the sacrifices in the Old Testament are. But this one has a very unique and special uh, application to us. It is not accidental that the details that are in here are in here. Verse 3, it says outside the camp. Remember when I said to highlight that? If you have a pen, write down this reference, cross-referencing over to the New Testament, which gives the explanation of it. It says in Hebrews 13, 12, Jesus was sacrificed outside the camp. He wasn't sacrificed at the temple, though they many times tried to kill him in that area. Hey, it says they took him out to a hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull, and they crucified him outside the town. And there they hung him on a piece of wood, a wooden cross, outside the temple. And you see that in verse 6 there, the wood that is thrown in there with there, and a, and, and a hyssop. Hyssop is a biblical symbol you see in the Psalms and other places for cleansing, for a purification. And you see the scarlet, which is the color of blood, and also the color of the robes that kings wore. And so you see it burned completely here, ashes to ashes, a total loss. And if you read the rest of the chapter, the red heifer's loss is very obviously their gain. He gave the life there of that heifer that they might live. But this is the point. They still died, didn't they? They still wandered in the wilderness and died. Physically, yes, but spiritually, no. They were saved by their faith in the promise and provision of God. His solution for their sin problem. And so the sin that they were in and the death that was in the world, well, sin brought death into the world, and death will bring us out of this world for every person. But for those who are in a right relationship with God, that death's door leads to a different destiny. Not the door to hell, the door to wrath, but the door to heaven. And interestingly enough, as you see the next chapter, the first verse, we won't go through that. Some of you say, oh, I'll die if we do. No, we'll go through that uh, later. But you see, the death of Miriam, the death of Miriam, that's Moses' sister. And also in that chapter, just to give you a little foreshadowing, even Aaron dies. So here's some godly people dying of old age, just quote-unquote natural causes. But as Ben Franklin said, remember, the only thing certain in this world is death and taxes. And so even for the godly people, hey, they paid their taxes. They even had death there. But the only thing that also is certain is that there is another world. There's another world. And in that world, hey, there's no death. There's no taxes. But there is Jesus, just Jesus. And that's the way, the truth, and the life, the living, giving God. He gave his life to us. That's what God did there in Genesis, gave his life to us. But you see in the Garden of Gethsemane, well, that was where he was actually making that declaration that he was going to give his life for us. That's what you see there. And I'm going to ask Pat and the worship team to come up. And during this time, we're going to have communion. You see the 
trays out here tonight who knows as I talk, even about these kind of sensitive subjects or whatever else, but you really realize, hey, this God, I don't know a God like that. I've always thought of him the way you described him at first, but I don't know him as the giving and living God. I don't know him as my Lord and Savior. If, if that's you here tonight, I just invite you before we partake of these elements. The Bible says this is for believers. And yeah, you could let it pass and say, well, I'm not a believer. I'm just here in these seats. But hey, what a better thing to do to say, I want to take the Lord in. And even in doing that, uh, I'm going to enjoy communion for the first time maybe today in a different way than I have before. But for the rest of us, what I want to think about here is just uh, a couple of cups. And I put two things here, and I know you guys each took one, but I put two up here because there's something I want to share with you, which is all throughout Scripture there are uh, symbols. And one of the symbols that are in Scripture is cup. It talks about a cup. And the context determines the content of the cup that is discussed. It's either good or it's bad. It's uh, something wonderful or it's something wicked and, and horrible. And so you see a, a cup sometimes mentioned of salvation or my cup runneth over, and those are good things. And you see also the cup of uh, something that's bad, you know, a poisonous thing or something in the Scripture. And so I want to turn with you mentally to a couple of Scriptures, and we'll put them up here on the screen. I know you're holding things in your hand, so maybe you don't want to juggle the Bible and spill all that stuff. But what you see is the first one, Luke chapter 22. And uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 15. It's a very important scripture, and hopefully they'll be able to get it up here on the screen for us. Luke 22, 15. But I'll read it for you. It's Jesus there talking with his disciples at the Last Supper. Right before his crucifixion, he had the Passover meal, and that's what he was doing with his disciples. And he says an interesting sentence. He says, with fervent desire, I have desired. I don't know if you noticed desire twice in there, but he's like, it's really emphasizing. I'm like, really, really wanted to do this. And he says, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to share a cup with you. I wanted to give you this cup. And I wanted to give you the significance of this cup. He says, this cup here, this Passover, this is what it really means. This is what the picture was painting. It's a new covenant in my blood. He says, this is given for you. I, I shed this for you. This is the cup that I want you to have here. And so if you think about it, just picture that as this cup over here, you know, the cup that they had. But then a few hours later, what you see is Jesus discussing a different cup. This is in Matthew 26, verse 39. And there he talks about a cup, and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is sweating, as the Bible says, as great drops of blood, wrestling with something that was tearing him apart, praying, and he says, Father, let this cup pass from me, if it's possible. If there's any other way, he says, let me pass on this cup. Let me not drink this cup. Now, again, two cups being discussed there. What are they? One was Jesus so excited saying, hey, guys, I want to share this cup with you. And then you see him looking at a cup and saying, Lord, Father, if there's some other way, then I have to drink that. Could we do it some other way? And you know what's interesting? As you think about this cup, you think about that cup, you think about these different things that we're talking about. What was in the different cups? Well, what was in the one that Jesus prayed would pass? Well, it was the wrath of God. That's what you see in it, in the scripture. The wrath of God. Death, separation, indignation, liquid hell, if you can think of it that way. Every sin that ever was. The wrath of God that would be upon those sins. Poured into a cup that Jesus would drink to the last drop. That's what you see in that cup. And not just the physical death. No, the Bible says that there was something so much worse that happened on the cross than just physical suffering. If that's all it was, well, Jesus was quite a man. He wasn't so concerned about those things as the fact that sin, he would become sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin for us. What a transaction took place there. And he said, if there's some other way, Lord, if there's some other way, Father, let this cup pass. But guess what? There wasn't another way. God didn't say, oh, oh, you're right. You know what? I'll tell you what. As long as people are good enough, that's good enough. <laughs> Just be good. Give some money to the church. Help some people here along the way, and you can buy the stairway to heaven. Now, here's the thing. The stairway to heaven isn't for sale. It can't be bought. It's only to be given. A given is a gift, as we've seen tonight, by the living, giving God. And the, that one cup, the wrath of God there. Well, that's what's there. But over here, Jesus said, this is a cup I wanted to give you. I wanted to give you this. And that, in that cup, is the grace of God, the forgiveness, the new covenant. Jesus says, I wanted to give you this cup. And what we realize is that Jesus drank this cup so we could drink that cup. He drank the cup of God's wrath for sin and death and all of that stuff, damnation, that we might freely take of this cup of God's grace. 
And so if you think about that, there's only two places for sin. It's either on Jesus or it's on me. If it's on Jesus, well, then the wrath of God was on Jesus and my sin is paid for. If my sin is still on me, well, then the wrath of God is still on me, though that's not what God would want. That's why he gave his son. And so again, as we think through those things and we hold those in our hand, I just pray that as we partake of them now and you're free to do that, just remember the fact that Jesus drank the cup of wrath so that we might drink the cup of redemption. And every time we do this in his remembrance, that's what we're remembering. So let's partake of it now together. I need to make sure I remember which one it is. This one. Hebrews 9.13, I'll read it for you as we part. It says, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, it's talking about that specific chapter we just studied. It says, if that could purify them from the outward problems of death, he says, here's the real thing. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Can I modify that slightly? The living, giving God. That's who we serve. God gave life to us. He gave his life for us. Sin took our life from us, but God gave it back. And so that's the clean conscience. That's the type of lives we can live. And he who did not spare his own son for us, how would he not give us graciously all things? Let's stand and be dismissed.